The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of Your Included, Reverend Dr. Elmer Collier discusses repentance and why we don't repent well. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Let's talk about repentance. What is repentance? How do you know if you've really repented? If you don't feel you repented, do you need to repent again? What is repentance all about? Yeah, well, uh, repentance, you know, the Greek word, word metanoia, you know, basically means to change 180 degrees and face the other direction. And, and I think why repentance uh, become such a focus, particularly in churches, um, more uh, conservative churches, uh, that really want to honor God, is this is the focus on what we really need to do um, if we're going to show uh, that we want to be in a right relationship with God. If we want renewal to happen in the church, you know, we need to repent. And one of the tragic things about this, Mike, is that in the pattern of salvation, the way grace realizes itself in our life, at whatever point uh, we make part of that something that we do in and of ourselves, apart from grace, there's something we need to do to get it right in order for salvation to work or renewal to work or whatever, that always becomes the place where we focus our energy and it always becomes the weak link in the chain. And it's particularly tragic with repentance because if there's anything that quickly becomes um, evident um, you know, for Christians is that we don't repent very well. And so we think we've repented, we really changed our mind about something, and then about two days later we find out we haven't done a very good job of it. And so you have almost this ongoing cycle where people re try to repent and repent and repent over and over again, and it never really works very well. And so you never really believe that you ever did repent, because yes. repent means to change, and if you still are struggling, yeah. then you haven't repented. And yeah. until you do repent, you're yes. not going to be forgiven. Yes. And, and it, it takes us back to this uh, point that we talked about in, a, in an earlier uh, interview about that Christianity is not difficult, it's impossible. And this refers to all aspects of Christian faith. And at any point in the order of salvation where part of it becomes an autonomous act that we do on our own, apart from grace, that always becomes the weak link of the chain where we never get it right and we keep circling back around and around that particular point. And this is why repentance in churches becomes such a problem. But you know the story that I used a couple years ago when I did one of these about the 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 man from uh, California who was walking mm -hmm. on the ice uh, and um, and crawling across on his belly because he was afraid that he was going to go through, and then a, a a truck comes with a load of logs and goes across the ice, and how they both had very radically different experiences. One was absolutely scared, and the other one was not afraid at all. Um, but the important point of the illustration is not about the quality of either of their faith, it's about the quality of the ice. And Christ is thick ice, it holds us up, you know, in our weak faith. And the same is true with repentance and every other aspect of the order of salvation. As soon as we turn it into something primarily that we do, apart from Christ, we get ourselves in a whole heap of trouble and it doesn't work very well. The bottom line is we don't repent or right. We don't repent or right. Christ even had to do that for us. Uh, Jesus, you know, baptism at the Jordan, you know, a lot of times people have a difficult time making sense of it. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? You know, he had never sinned. There was no sins to repent of. Whose sins was he confessing and repenting of in the Jordan? Well, it wasn't his own, it was ours. In his total identification with us, taking our diseased and sinful humanity that we never can turn back to God on our own, never rightly repent, that's part of what Christ's life um, and death and resurrection is all about repenting in our place. He goes down into the Jordan confessing all of our sins, repenting for them in a way that we never repent for them aright, and comes out and then receives the Spirit of God into the human nature that he took um, uh, from us uh, 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 in the incarnation. So we don't even repent of right. Christ has to repent for us, and our repentance never can ever be anything but an echo of his repentance on our behalf. Now this is tremendously freeing, Mike, because once we realize that we don't even repent to right, when we repent, we can repent as much as we can at that particular point in time and not all the time be looking at our shoulder wondering whether we got it right or not. 
Because what actually happens when we repent, it's already the Spirit of God echoing Christ's repentance in us that leads us to that point. And when we actually repent, as much as we can at that particular moment in time, the Spirit takes our imperfect repentance, Christ seated at the right hand of the Father even now takes our repentance, perfects it, does it right, and presents it to the Father on our behalf. And so we don't need to worry about whether or not um, we repent or right. Now this is where a lot of people uh, misunderstand the relationship between divine agency and human agency in our salvation. You mean what we have to do, do and, and what, what God, God has to do. Us, yeah. Yes. And uh, as Gary Detto, uh, my good friend uh, at InterVarsity says, many Christians turn the relationship between divine agency and human agency in salvation into a zero-sum game. So if God does part, you know, either God does 100% and we do nothing, so when I say that Christ repents on our behalf, that means we don't have to do anything at all, so we don't have to repent, or God does part and we do part, and this is where most Christians come out, I think, secretly, even if they don't admit it theologically, secretly they think there's something that they've got to do in and out of themselves to contribute to their salvation, and if they don't do it right, then it's going to mess the whole thing up. And whether it's repentance, whether it's faith, whether it's love, Whatever it is, at any point where they think it's something they have to do in and out of themselves, you know, 50% God, but this is their 50% or 10%, however they parcel it out, that becomes the weak link in the chain where they're found in bondage. The problem is this is the wrong way to think about the relationship between uh, divine agency and, and human agency in salvation. And the best way, I think, to, uh, to think about this is to go back to Jesus Christ himself, the second person of the Trinity incarnate as a human being where we have 100% divine agency. The, the, the second person, the Trinity, has in fact assumed our actual diseased and alienated humanity. 100% divine agency throughout Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And yet, we have a fully human Jesus too, don't we? And in theology, we talk about this as the n-hypostasis and hypostasis couplet. N-hypostasis and hypostasis means that there is no separate human being apart from the Incarnation. In other words, if the second person of the Trinity had not been come incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth, there never would have been a Jesus. It's only because of the Incarnation, because of the virgin birth, that there is an actual Jesus. But en hypostasis means en hypostatic in the Word, in the Incarnation, there is a real Jesus, a real human Jesus. Indeed, in some respects, Jesus is far more human and more of a character than we are. This is part of the reason I love John's Gospel. You remember the miracle? that Jesus does first in John's Gospel. It's the turning of water into wine. Now, you know, there are a lot of Christians that have a problem with this human Jesus in John's Gospel uh, there at the wedding. First of all, he's at a wedding. The Son of Man, the Son of God incarnate, who's got all this great work to do to redeem humanity, and here he is messing around at a wedding. You know, what's all that about? Indeed, the first a miracle he does is changing the water into wine. And you remember the story, you know, the servants, you know, say there is no more wine, um, you know, and, and um, Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, comes to him, they have no more wine. Probably rolled his eyes, you know, why do you involve me, woman? And he ends up um, changing the water into wine, not just wine, but five or six stone containers that probably held about 30 gallons of wine. So that's maybe 120 to 150 gallons of wine. You know, our, my entire seminary could get a little tipsy on that much wine. And Jesus does this miracle to allow the celebration to continue. It says something about the profound character of his humanity. So is there anything incompatible in Jesus' life, his death and his resurrection, between 100% human agency and 100% divine agency? There, they're completely compatible, aren't they? Why would we think that any place in the order of salvation it would be any different? God's grace, when God's grace is actively involved in our life, it doesn't in any way dehumanize us. It doesn't undermine our human agency. Indeed, we may become more fully human, more fully personal, more fully Mike and L than we ever were before. So to try to help people think about this, I, I tell my students in seminary, think about the time in your life when you were most profoundly aware of God's love and presence in your life. Most profoundly aware, Mike, that you were loved by God and forgiven. In that moment of time, did you somehow cease to be Mike when God's agency was actively involved in your life? Did you somehow turn into a robot at that moment? Weren't you more fully the Mike that you really are at that moment of your life than in any other time? 
So what you see is there's no inconsistency between divine and human agency in reality. It's in our thinking about it that we get into trouble. And so the more the Spirit of God is filling us, remember this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, we're to be being filled with the Spirit of God. The more Christ is living his life through us, Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. When the Spirit fills us, uh, and Christ is living his life through us, it's the same reality. One looked at from the perspective of the Holy Spirit's activity, one looked at from the perspective of Christ's activity, and what happens? We obey God the Father. So Christ living his life through us, the Spirit filling us, and us obeying God the Father are simply looking at the same reality from the activity of each of the persons of the Trinity. When that happens, we become more fully human, more fully personal, more fully agenic than we ever were before. In other words, it frees us. God's grace frees us for our human agency, doesn't undermine it. Part of the problem is, is that when we human beings think about free will and agency, we tend to think about it in making choices between um, two different things. You know, like in the supermarket, you can choose between um, Rice Krispies and cornflakes. But what Christian faith means by Christian liberty is something far more complicated. If we had a piano in this room, I have the freedom to sit down and play the piano. But I don't know how to play the piano, and I don't read music very well. And while I can plunk the keys, I do not have the liberty to play Mozart. The only way I would be able to play Mozart is if I became a different kind of human being. If I had the skills and the abilities to be able to do that. Christian liberty is more like the liberty to play Mozart than it is freedom of will to choose between A and B. And the grace of God sets us at liberty to be able to respond. So there isn't an incompatibility between divine and human agency. And so that's why it's only um, when the grace of God is actively involved in our life that we can repent at all. And even when we do it imperfectly, Christ takes it and perfects it and presents it to God on our behalf. And that's true of every aspect of Christian faith. Every aspect of Christian faith, whether it's faith, whether it's repentance, whether it's obedience, those are all things that are absolutely impossibilities. We do not have the human potentiality to do it apart from Christ living his life through us. So repentance and faith are pretty much the same thing in that, that in repentance, what we're actually doing is trusting Christ to be who he is for us. Mm -hmm. And even in that trust, we're trusting him to trust for us. Mm -hmm in who he is for us. Mm -hmm. And the great irony is that it's precisely in that moment when we realize that it's not about the quality of our faith, not about the quality of our repentance, not about the quality of our obedience, but about the quality of our Savior, that we paradoxically at that moment find the freedom to be able to do it. Yeah. Even though we don't do it uh, perfectly, it's when the fear that we're not going to get it right is finally removed because we're absolutely convinced that Christ has already done it right on our behalf, in our place, not in a way that displaces our response, but a way that undergirds it and sets it free, that then, guess what? We lose the fear that we're not going to get it right, and it becomes yeah. something that's entirely natural. Yeah. And another way to explain this um, relation between divine and human agencies, uh, Torrance uses it in terms of his children, I'll use it in terms of my son. When my sons were first trying to learn how to walk, um, they would grab my finger uh, with their hands, and I would grab their hands with my hands, and I would hold them as they walk. Now, who's really holding who? You know, they're really gripping my finger, but it's not really their grip on my finger that's the controlling issue, is it? It's my grip of their fingers. It's the same way in the relationship between divine and human agency. We really do respond in faith, but it's very imperfect. And it's not the quality of our faith or any of our responses that's finally determinative. It's the quality of what Christ has already done and God's grasp of us in Christ that never lets go. It's actually uh, Christ we're trusting, not our faith we're trusting. Exactly. I find myself needing to say sometimes that yes. to remind myself. And, and I think, so I have to say, you know, I, I really don't have much faith here. In, in, in how this is playing out. Yes. But the, I have to actually tell myself, I don't need to worry about that because yes. Christ has enough faith for both of us. Yes. I'm trusting him, not me, so 
I don't need to worry about my lack of faith. He'll take care of it. Yes. By taking that extra little, I mean, sometimes you have to just be very concrete with yourself. Yes. Maybe not everybody does, but yes. sometimes I need to rehearse it. Yes. And so that helps me remember uh, it's him I'm trusting. It's not that I need enough yes. faith because I don't have enough faith, but yeah. he'll take care of it. It's exactly right. And in, in, in my life as a pastor, in my own life as a Christian, I found that almost always there's some aspect in that order of salvation, you know, some human aspect in there where one Christian or another will attach to it. That's what I've got to do. And that always becomes the weak link and the, which they fixate on. It's always the thing they worry about that they haven't done right. They become obsessed with it. They become obsessed with it, and it becomes the thing that messes up their Christian freedom and liberty because they think if they don't get it right, again, it's that deus absconditus back there. They're not going to get their part right, and it, the whole thing is going to collapse like a house of cards, and they're going to end up being on the outside. Yeah, and it's like that God is going to come out and throw a curse at you. Yeah. And Jesus is holding him at bay yes. as best he can. Yeah. But it, in the end, he's really mad and he's going to get one of those lightning bolts past Jesus, a yeah. uh, big catcher's mitt, and it's going to hit you. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. And it goes back to other things that we've talked about in these uh, conversations that oftentimes the God that people most believe in, in their heart of heart, you know, the thing about ultimate beliefs, it's not the ones in our head. It's the ones that go to yeah. the core of our being yeah. and influence fundamental behavior at this level that are really the core ones. And a lot of times what people believe in their head and how they actually behave, what their ultimate beliefs in their heart are not commensurate. And you're exactly right. Oftentimes, behind the back of Jesus is the angry God the Father. The one God that they develop, you know, on the basis of taking human attributes and perfecting them and projecting them onto God. And Jesus becomes the intermediary. But when you look at the cross, what you find is that it isn't simply Jesus that identifies with us. All the persons of the Trinity suffered there on the cross. The Father suffers the giving up the Son unto death. We have no idea what it meant for the cost that God the Father paid for our redemption. So all the persons are involved in it there. So you can't have an angry God the Father doing something different than the Son. This is an inadequate understanding of God, an inadequate doctrine of the Trinity. This is why the doctrine of the Trinity calls that doctrine of the one God and and all of the, the funky attributes that go along with it, the deus absconditus that we're worried about, calls it into question. Jesus on the cross is a window into the very heart of God. There is no different God the Father or any other God behind the back that we have to fear. It, it, the, the way, one of the interesting places this plays itself out and goes back to this whole issue of how we interpret Scripture that we can pick up maybe in another session, it's always interesting to me the Scripture that Christians fasten on as the key t troubling text. And almost always, they're texts about what we have to do, about what we have to do. Uh, and it's like, those are the ones that resonate with that deus absconditus, resonate with that human agency having to, um, to, uh, to contribute something. And so they become the primary texts that blind our eyes to what the other texts say. And this is an inadequate way, this is why the concordance method of doing interpretation, just looking up what Scripture has to say about a particular theme never works. You have to look at the entire fabric of Scripture to get it. So it's interesting, you know, that in, um, you know, that uh, in John 15, where Jesus says, you know, that if you love me, you obey my commands, all that whole thing. They forget the first part of John 15, which is what? Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a branch remains in me, it will bear much fruit. And then comes that verse that we just really don't believe in our heart of hearts. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You mean there isn't something we can contribute on our own? Jesus seems to say there isn't in that text. In fact, if you look in, in there that the word uh, remain is meno. If you read John's gospel and look at um, everything it has to say about meno, it's the same uh, word that Jesus uses in terms of the relationship between Jesus and the Father as the you know, the Father is in me and I am in the Father, it's meno. And Jesus says that's the same thing we're to do with him, we're to meno. He's to remain in us and we're to remain in him. And unless we do that, we can do nothing. But that's the absolutely good news of the gospel. Because that means there isn't anything in the Christian life that we ever do have to do, ever need to do, on our own, apart from what Christ has already done for us in his vicarious life, death, and resurrection. He has already done it all, not in a way that cancels our humanity, but a way that frees us. 
He echoes his faith, his repentance, his obedience in us. And it's when we stop worrying about the quality of our, our faith, our repentance, and our obedience, guess what? It becomes actually easier to be able to do those things. And even then, we don't do it perfectly, and we always have to depend upon Christ, our high priest, who's at the right hand of God. But it's ironic, isn't it, that we, that we actually obsess and fixate on our weakest points mm -hmm. and spend most of our time worried about that, concerned about it, working on it, you know, going through this step and that step, yep. list, listening to sermons or preparing sermons on it. And that distracts us from what we really need to be focused yes. on, which is all good yes. because we're so fo focused on, on these areas of weakness. Yes. That's a very good point, and once again, it shows, particularly in North America, how our rugged individualism, you know, that we're expected, you know, all the way along the way to pull ourselves up, uh, you know, by our own bootstraps, that we have the capacity to do these things, while at the same time, we have all these 12-step groups of compulsive behaviors where we have to admit we're powerless. You know, we could learn from the 12-step groups, you know, I mean, in some respects, all the 12-step groups, when it says, I'm powerless before this habit, it's basically echoing what Jesus says in, in John 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from a higher power, apart from Christ, we cannot, you know, break the holds on our things. If, if Christians, if every time we get in that mode, you know, where we obsess about something and get worried about it, if we could just remember that verse and just remember we're powerless, we are powerless apart from the grace of God in Christ, we'd be a lot better off. That's why it, it's, not, it's not difficult to be a Christian, it's impossible. <laughs> and the sooner we learn it, the better off we'd be. Same thing is true with ministry. You know, sometimes pastors, the pastors who are listening, you know, they think ministry becomes their responsibility. Now, you want to turn ministry into a drudgery. Just think ministry is primarily what we do for God in response to the gospel. That's not what ministry is in the New Testament. Ministry is primarily Jesus' high priestly ministry, now at the right hand of God, where he's still the incarnate Savior that he was. You know, what takes place in Christ's life, death, and resurrection isn't a passing episode. It isn't simply past. This is why the resurrection and the ascension are so absolutely crucial to Christian faith. Christ still is the incarnate one. He still has that very vicarious humanity that where he believed in our place, repented in our place, obeyed in our, uh, our place throughout his life, that humanity is still right now in the presence of God. He is our great high priest. And so that's absolutely uh, crucial. And when we lose that, you know, we lose something fundamental. And the same is true with ministry. It's not primarily our ministry. It's primarily Christ's ministry. And insofar as we're willing to step back from any situation in ministry and acknowledge that it's he's the one that has to do the work, we're a lot more effective. The more we think the burden of responsibility rests on us, that's a surefire way for pastoral burnout. Just think that some aspect or all of ministry is our, primarily our responsibility, not Christ's responsibility. Where when we know that Christ is the real minister and we're simply called to participate in his ministry, it makes ministry a joy. You know, sometimes at the end of the day, you know, you can ask, Christ, well, what did you do through my ministry today? And, and you know, if we knew what he did, we'd either be disappointed that it didn't conform to what we expected, or we'd become arrogant that he'd done so much. So sometimes Christ just says to me, mind your own business. <laughs> you know, I'll take care of my part. Yeah. Your part is simply to allow me to work through you in each and every situation uh, that you're in and trust that I'm doing it without worrying all the time about the results. Well, isn't that exactly what we do oftentimes with the idea of making disciples? We, we get the idea that it's our job to go out and make disciples. Yeah. We make the congregation feel uh, uh, guilt-ridden, if we can, yeah. that they haven't done enough to go out and make yeah. disciples. So we actually turn that yes. uh, into, a, into a fresh kind of work yeah. that is on our shoulders, yeah. where now yeah. that we've been forgiven, we have the obligation and yeah. responsibility to go out and make disciples. And, and there's a lot of guilt associated with that. Well, well for all the pastors out there, you know, my, my question for them is, how's that working for you? Yeah, how's it, how's it going? <laughs> how's that working for you? <laughs> but it seems like at, at the end of every week, we've got a brand new plan, a brand new uh, program, a yeah. brand new uh, set of steps, uh, a new, brand new set of sermons yeah. to make it happen. Yeah, well, you know, we, we, we Methodists, we, we, you know, we've even taken it one step further. You know, we don't simply do it out of obedience. Now, we've, we're, we're shrinking so dramatically. We've lost 60,000 members a year on average since 1968 when we became the United Methodist Church. We've shrunk so dramatically that now we're um, encouraging people to do evangelism and to reach out because uh, of survival. <laughs> you know, we're concerned yeah. that unless we yeah. do that, we're not going to have enough people to pay the bills. 
Well, let me tell you, you want to you wanna turn people off, just have a congregation that's in the survival mode. You know, people come in the door and, and, and they smell it. You know, you can't hide it. You know, when you're in ministry out of fear or out of guilt, uh, it just doesn't work because it or, isn't. Or desperation. Or desperation. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Those things don't work. And that's why so many of the programs that we try don't work. It isn't that the programs are bad in themselves. It's that we're doing them out of desperation or we're doing them out of, out of guilt because we know we need to do something. And those motives. Or to pay the bills. Yeah, or to pay the bills, whatever it is. But all of those motives betray the gospel at the core. You know, betray the gospel of the court. When I, when I get sent by the bishop and cabinet into small struggling congregations, I know that until I get them out of that mindset where ministry and mission is what they do because they have to, it's their responsibility, they're doing it out of or, guilt. Or should. Or should do it, or they're doing it out of desperation because yeah. if they don't, they'll die. Until I get them out of that mind, mindset, no matter what program we use, it will not work. So the first thing, you know, that I have to get them, you know, convinced of is that they even if there's only a handful of people, elderly people, it's a dying congregation in a dying farming community, which is where I get appointed to a lot around Dubuque, that they are, in fact, a little missionary outpost. They are the people of God who have been claimed with, by Christ, entrusted with the treasure of the gospel, and simply are called upon to let Christ do his work in and through them um, is as inadequate as they seem to the task. This is where the, the, the gospel records, uh, you know, so helpfully illuminate for us the pattern of ministry that we ought to have. I mean, there's that wonderful story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus the women and the children. You know, it's, it, Jesus has taught them all day. The kids are getting restless. The disciples come and say, you know, send the people away so they can get something to eat. Um, John's gospel says, uh, Jesus said, you give them something to eat. It said Jesus already had, had in mind what he was going to do. The disciples say it's utterly impossible. It's utterly impossible. You can't feed all these people with what we've got. You know, the only person in that story that seems to have a clue about this is the little boy who has the five barley loaves and the two small fish. Now, he's not stupid. He knows they can't feed 5,000 men plus the women and the children. But he knows something about who Jesus is. And so he takes the little that he has and he entrusts it into the hand of Jesus and trusts that Jesus will do the rest. And Jesus does an astonishing miracle. Well, you know, when we think about ministry, a struggling congregation with a handful of people, you know, many of us who are pastors, we realize, you know, we're not the most effective pastors in the world. What could Christ ever do through us? Well, you know, we're a lot like those five barley loaves and two small fish. There's no way that we have the human resources and the ability to fulfill what Christ asks us to do. It's not difficult, it's impossible in ministry too. And so we lay it in the hands of Jesus and let him take us and break us and use us, and he does what's absolutely impossible. And so the same is true with ministry. And my word to, to, you know, to all those pastors out listening today, those you know, persons and congregations who are maybe, maybe struggling, you know, focus your eyes on the one who has touched your life Realize that he is the one who is sufficient to the task of ministry, and you're just barley loaves and fish, and place yourself in Christ's hands, and you'll be a lot further ahead in whatever program you use than if you think the responsibility primarily falls upon you. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.